All right, everyone, welcome to our first section for CS164. Um, so these are brand new. This is our first one, even though we're a little bit into the course. Um, so the goal of today is really to walk you through creating an MVC application and really go over the specifics of what MVC is with examples of actual models and actual controllers. And then hopefully if you had a little trouble starting the project or you're not as far along as you would like to be, um, this will help you get to where you're ready to hand something in. Um, so just a reminder, these will be videotaped. Um, so tell all your friends that it's online if they couldn't make it here today. And just our agenda is we're going over MVC in that order and then some other things that you'll probably want to do with your application. Um, so first, because MVC starts with M, let's start there. So using the CodeIgniter framework, uh, which we're using for this project, all of your model files are going to be accessing what's accessing the database. So there's really nothing else that a model does other than access the database and return data. So using CodeIgniter, all of your model files are going to be stored under application slash models. And this is just a CodeIgniter thing. CodeIgniter says, well, I just want all of your models to be there. And that's just the way CodeIgniter works. This is by no means like a, if you're making a website, you must have a folder called application. You must have a folder called models. This is just a CodeIgniter convention that if you follow, that means CodeIgniter can use your code a little bit easier. Um, so on that note, CodeIgniter is very, very, very well documented. Um, so definitely read the documentation. If you're confused, like, how do I do this in CodeIgniter, or does a function for this exist, definitely, definitely, definitely uh, read, at the very least, this page, which, if you haven't already, basically lists out nice and categorically, you know, what are the functions I need in order to insert data, and even have these nice examples. So if at any point you're confused and Googling isn't helpful, actually read this documentation. This is a very real-world software development problem, right? I mean, once you get into the real world, you're not going to have sections where people like me just walk you through all the functions you'll need. You know, reading the documentation is something that you'll actually need to do once you start developing software. So it's a really good practice to get used to reading these kinds of articles and learning how to look these kind of things up. And CodeIgniter is really, really nice because it's a nice table of contents. You can search it. Um, so this is a good starting point. So CodeIgniter models um, are basically ways of building queries. So CodeIgniter isn't really active record. That pattern that we looked at a little bit on lecture on Monday, um, even though CodeIgniter kind of claims to be, if you look at the Wikipedia article, which we all know is the authoritative source of information on the internet, they actually nicely point out that CodeIgniter is not actually active record. What it really is is more is just a set of methods that are designed to help you build queries. So you don't have to write the SQL yourself, uh, which can get pretty messy. So this is just one such query. Um, so you notice that they're all going to start with this DB object. And this DB object is a property of every single model class. So when you write your model, you say something like, you know, class post extends CI model. So that extends CI model says that this class that I'm writing right now is going to inherit from this class CI model that someone else wrote. Because someone else wrote it, they put in a bunch of handy variables and functions and all that kind of thing that you can now access just because you said extends CI model. So one of those such properties you can now access is this DB object, which is basically the origin of all of these queries. So if you, for example, wanted to do something like get the entire database, you'd say this DB, so I'd say I want to use this DB object, and I want to call this method get, and I'm going to specify my table name, and that's going to actually build up the SQL query. Then when you actually want to execute the query, you're going to call result. And result is going to return to you an array of objects. So uh, in CodeIgniter, these objects are actually just this PHP standard class, uh, which, as we mentioned in lecture, is the equivalent of a Java object. It's just kind of an untyped class. You can add things to it as you wish. It's just kind of the very basic class that has nothing in it yet. If you don't want to work with that and instead would rather have an associative array, you can actually just say, um, instead of result, just result underscore array. Now, instead of getting back an array of objects, you're going to get back an array of associative arrays. Um, so your preference, which of those you'd want to work with, but do be consistent throughout your application with working with either result objects or result arrays. Um, so just as I said before, it's not really active record. This is not an ORM, if you've heard that term before. This is just a collection of methods that help you build queries without having to write MySQL yourself. So here's a couple examples of how I could do something like read from the database. And so let's just walk through these. Um, so if I say this DB again, which is going to start off all of our queries, then something like where in. So if you happen to remember in MySQL, this is something I can use to check if a column is in some list of values. So here I'm saying, all right, so if this column, which I've just called column because I'm really original, has the value either 1 or 2 or 3, that means I'm going to return it from the database. 
so there's our condition. And then again, I'm just kind of chaining together all of these methods, because they just happen to return this DB object. So I can, instead of saying this DB where in semicolon, this DB get semicolon, I can just do what's called chain these together, just because of what these methods are actually returning. So there's my condition first. Then I'm going to get, specify the table that I'm getting the data from, and then actually execute the query. So that is equivalent to the SQL below that. Questions? Yeah. Exactly. So column here is the name of the column. And this array, 1, 2, 3, are the values that you want to read. So if that column has the value 1 or 2 or 3, I want to return it. So yes, that's a good point. By the way, ask lots of questions. Um, based on what we've seen, you have a lot of questions. And this is the place to ask them. Um, if you're afraid to ask them in lecture, don't be afraid here. I'm nicer. Uh, so, so that's where in. So more basic, maybe, um, is just get all the rows where some column is, act, is exactly equal to some value. So rather than checking some lists, let's just say, well, where this column, again called column, has the value of this string value. So this is equivalent to saying um, select star from table where column is equal to value. So you notice here that this get underscore where is actually a convenience function. Right? You'll notice before we had to say, uh, we, we could have said this db where and then get. The guys behind coding now just said, well, that's kind of something you're going to type a whole lot. So let's just bundle in this where and this get into a single function called get where. So the second argument to get where, uh, where the first is the table, uh, that corresponds to the get. And then the where is going to be an array of proper, like an associative array of all the properties you want to be true in the rows you're getting back. So in this case, we're only saying where the column equals the value. If you had more than one thing inside of this associative array, it would end them together. So if I said, you know, array column goes to value, comma column two goes to some other value, it would say I want only the rows where the first column has that first string and some other column has some other string. So you can basically use this uh, to narrow down your search. So while this will and them together, CodeIgniter also has a bunch of methods that instead of ending will or them together. So you could say something like where this or where that or where that, where all the re rows returned will be just that, where any of those things are true. So definitely consult the documentation for something like that. Uh, writing things to the database is just as straightforward. So if, again, I have this DB object, I have this insert method that's going to take, again, what table I'm inserting into, and then an associative array or a standard class object that contains the properties I want to insert. So if I want a new row uh, where this column has this value, I could just pass in either an associative array mapping column to value or a standard class object with a property called column that has the string value. And so same thing with update. Pretty straightforward. You need to specify a where condition so that you don't update the whole table. And then you can just call this update function. Straightforward to everybody? OK. So um, while we're all sure that you all did lab two, and by all I mean nobody, uh, we're going to take a look at what we built in lab two and kind of walk you through uh, what I call Twitter Nighter because I'm really good at portmanteaus. So we're going to essentially build Twitter here. So we probably want to have a table representing a tweet. So a tweet, in this case, is just going to have a username, and it's going to have the actual content of the tweet. So along with that table, we want to have a model. Because remember, the model is the only thing that can access the database. So it makes sense is for each table in your database, you want to have a corresponding model that accesses it. So if our table is called tweets in lowercase, we probably want our model to be called tweet. And that's going to be an application.model. And that's going to define this tweet class, because each Effectively, each instance of this is going to represent a single tweet. So let's take a look at that. So if we look at our tweet model, so we're starting off with PHP, our PHP declaration because we're in PHP. Now we're creating a new class. We're saying tweet, and remember, we're extending the CI model. That says everything that's defined in the CI model class, I want to. And I can just get that by simply saying extends CI model. So now we have two things you want to do with tweets. We want to be able to add tweets to the database, and we want to be able to read tweets from the database right now. So before we go anywhere, let's just take a look at this kind of cryptic looking line. So as we saw in lecture, this is what's called a constructor. And this constructor in PHP, this dollar, uh, not dollar sign, underscore, underscore construct, is just this reserved method that's defined by PHP that if you define what this method does, this will get fired every single time um, that the class is instantiated. Now, you probably don't need to actually instantiate this class yourself, but it's something that you're going to want CodeIgniter to do for you from the controller. So every time that I instantiate this class, 
I want to execute this code. So don't worry about tags yet, but do you realize that the CI model itself has a constructor defined? So if we say, OK, I no longer want you to use the constructor that's defined in CI model. I want you to use this one. That's not good, because that constructor in CI model was actually pretty important. And it happened to be doing things, maybe like connecting to the database or setting some properties, that if we wipe that out, they're not going to get done, and this model isn't going to work. So the way to circumvent that, or kind of prevent that, is to use this line here. And this is saying, I want you to call the constructor of my parent class. So in this case, what's the parent class? It's going to be CI model, because that's what we're now extending. So by saying parent, this is going to say, get me the parent class. And this is just kind of the weird looking syntax to actually call that method in the parent class. So now once I call this, I'm now calling the constructor for CI model, which I should do first, because that was originally going to be first anyway. And now after I've set all those properties and CI has done what it needs to do, I can now start doing whatever else I need to do in my constructor. So do these two really cryptic lines make sense? OK, again, just feel free to ask questions um, at any point if they don't make sense. Yeah? So you said that we should have a model class for all of our tables? So should we have a model, in a, a, model in a, a model class for all of our tables? So I guess that's kind of up to you. I mean, if you have a table that you, know, you're, that you could basically factor into another model, then certainly feel free to do so. Um, but it would be pretty good practice that it's a good way to separate your code, right, to have one model for each table. Um, but if you see the need, like, oh, do I like, really need a model here when it's just like this trivial operation that I'm only doing once, then it might be a little overkill. Um, but in general, when you're starting to do complex things with tables, it's going to be nice to have a single model for each table. Other questions? OK, so first, let's look at how we can add a tweet. This is pretty simple. Our function is just going to take one argument. It's going to be the tweet that we'd like to add. Well, remember, this can be an object or an associative array. And we're just going to insert it into the database. Our table is called tweets. And there's our tweet object. Now, it's really helpful a lot of the time is after you insert something, you want to know what that ID that was just inserted was. So we looked at you know, auto, -incremented com auto incremented columns, which are commonly the primary key of a database, which means that the value in that column is going to be unique over all the rows. And so CodeIgniter provides this nice little method called insert underscore ID that's going to return to you that unique identifier, assuming that you have some column in your database called ID that's set to primary key and auto increment, which, as a rule of thumb, you pretty much always want to have. There is no better unique identifier than something you say, this is a unique identifier. Um, so often that'll be a lot, of, a lot nicer than trying to figure out what column you can kind of squeeze into be a primary key. Just create a new column called ID, make it some big integer, and make it so it auto increments, and you can get this functionality really nicely. So if this db, this db insert function returns false, that means that the insert did not succeed. Um, so as you're writing your application, error checking is very, very important. We can't just assume that this insert would succeed. And what's, what's some conditions under which this would fail? Exactly. So there's one. So what if, what if I you know, mistype this and I said something where it's some table that did not exist? In this case, the, the insert would now fail. Anything else? OK, so if we hop over to PHP my admin here, um, you can see my tweets table. And here, as I said, it just has a username that's a ver chair, it has some content, and it has a timestamp. But now, you'll notice that I've said that none of these fields can be null. So if I've specified, well, this can't be null, and then I haven't defined what this column value is, then this insert could fail. Because I've said it can't be null, I haven't told you what it is, so MySQL is going to yell at you, and this db insert is going to fail. Make sense? So definitely very good to litter all of your models and controllers um, with error checking like this. Yeah? If you use an insert ignore, is there a way to like, see which column I can be ignored? So if you use an insert ignore, in what sense be ignored? So if you want a little more information about your queries, there's a really handy SQL keyword called explain. Um, if you want to open up phpMyAdmin, you can just say explain and then run some query, and it'll output a bunch of information, like what actually occurred, or if the query failed, why exactly it failed. Um, and so that might give you a little more insight as to why something is or isn't working. 
So that's adding a tweet. So now the other thing we'd like to do um, is get all of the tweets that should be on our little news feed, which in this case I'm just saying I want the 20 most, uh, the 20 most recent tweets. Uh, so we're just looking at this line right here. Ignore everything below that for now. So this again, uh, we're using this method chaining on this DB object. We're saying this DB, because we're going to the database. Now this limit says I only want 20 results. And this is a really, really handy MySQL function, because you may find yourself you know, without this limit, you'd find yourself having this big array of objects, and then you'd have like a for loop that goes from 1 to 20, and you build some other array or like strip everything else off, and be kind of awkward when MySQL does this for you. This will say, after you found 20 results, just stop. And so doing this limit will obviously increase the performance of your query, because MySQL won't waste its time looking at a bunch of other rows. So we're only getting 20 tweets. And now this order by is just that. What order do we want them in? So I have to find this timestamp column, uh, which as you can see, is set to be the default value as the current time. So if I don't specify this value, that's OK. Our insert's not going to fail, because MySQL is just going to fall back and say, well, I want this value to be the current time. So if I order by descending timestamp, what does that mean? What order am I getting the tweets back in? <coughs> exactly. So the newest is now the first, because a higher timestamp value means that it's been more seconds since January 1st, 1970, which is how these times are defined. And if there have been more seconds after that, that means it's more recent, as far as I'm concerned. So if I had ascending timestamp, I said ASC instead of DSC here, that means I would get the oldest tweets first, because the timestamps would be going up rather than going down. So now once I say result, I'm going to get back all of those objects, and then I can just return them. Make sense? OK. So that's our starting model. We just have these two model functions that we've written ourselves called add and get newsfeed. And we're going to start to use them. So next up is the V in MVC, which is the view. So the view is used to display data and nothing else. And this is the part that really gets people or annoys people. You should never, ever, 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 ever be calling something like MySQL query or MySQL select DB from a view. That totally breaks this abstraction. The model is for accessing the database. The view is for displaying data. Similarly, the controller should never say, like, echo this or print this, because that's not the job of the controller either, but more on that later. So a view um, can contain both HTML, you know, how you're actually going to be displaying things like an input element, as well as PHP, which you can use to do something like iterate over data or something like that. Um, for our formatting, uh, one function you might want to take a look at is the PHP date function. Uh, which is super, super handy in converting things like date times and timestamps from the database into a human readable date format. Um, so the function's called date, and the function stir to time, str and then to time, all one word, is also handy for converting a timestamp into a numerical thing you can pass into dates. So the view for our tweets is pretty simple. Um, so views are going to be stored in application views. So you notice here that I've uh, created a new folder um, called tweets, and then I've said slash index.php. Now, the reason I've done this is because this view is going to be called by, eventually, this function in my controller called index. So because this is used by the tweets controller, I've created this subdirectory called tweets, and then all of the views corresponding to tweets are going to go in there. So if I said had like a tags view or a comments a tags controller or a comments controller, I would probably want to make a new subdirectory called tags or comments inside of application views, just so your code doesn't have to be something like tweets underscore index, or it gets really confusing which views correspond to what. And similarly, because this view is used by a method, will be used by a method called index, I've just called it index.php. So in here, uh, we're using jQuery mobile, so more on that a little later. But we just have some HTML that displays the title for our page. And we just have some inputs where you can type in a username and a tweet, because we didn't bother um, implementing user login. Now here is where we're actually displaying some data. Um, so what's really nice about PHP, I think, is this little known syntax uh, with this colon that can be used to iterate over something. So if I say PHP for each something, I'm basically opening up a for loop. And now I'm going to say all the tweets that I have, I want to iterate over each of those. And I want to reference that using an object called tweet. And I can just output it. Again, you don't have to say something like PHP echo. You can actually just say uh, this question mark equal sign to output a value. Um, what I personally don't like, um, and David hates me for, is things like this, 
This is also technically OK, um, but it is recommended officially that you have the PHP there. Um, but this equal sign is surprisingly OK and recommended. Um, so that's just a side note. So now if I use this colon, and I can end my for each loop with this end for each. And in my opinion, that's a little nicer um, than doing something like this, uh, which causes, I don't know, it's just nicer to look at, in my opinion. But definitely be consistent with using one or the other. Um, but that's one way in which you can iterate over some data. This colon, and then this end, and while, and for each, or whatever have you. Questions on the view? OK, that's good, because that should be straightforward. OK, so now uh, we're looking at the C, which is the controller at MVC. And the controller is effectively just a bridge between the view and the model. So remember I said that the view should never access the database, and the model should only access the database. So without something in between these two layers, there is no way to be sending data from the database to the view. And that's exactly the job of the controllers. It's going to take data in from the browser or from a view. It's going to pass that data to the model, can get back some data from the model, and then send that data back to the view. So this is effectively the intermediary uh, layer that will connect the models and the views. And that's all it will do. So here's how this is going to work. So I'm a user in a browser, and I go to a URL that looks something like this, slash courses, slash view, slash one. So what CodeIgniter is going to do is look for a controller called courses. Why does it know that? Because the controller is going to be the first thing inside of your URL, or a URI, as CodeIgniter likes to call it. Um, so it's going to look for that class. And if it exists, it's going to create a new instance of that class. So what's next? We're going to look at the next part of the URI, which is the view. So CodeIgniter is going to say, OK, well, that means that you're looking to call a method called view. So based on that new object that was just instantiated by CodeIgniter, CodeIgniter is then going to call that method called view. What is it going to do with that? It's going to pass in the remaining parts of the URL in as arguments to that function. So if I had you know, slash one slash comments, that would mean that this controller method had to take two parameters, uh, one for an ID and one for something else. So in this case, because there's only one thing after the controller and after the action and after the method, that means that this method in our controller should only be taking one function. So is that process clear to everyone? What's actually going on when I request a URL in a CodeIgniter app? Yeah? What happens if you put in an improper URL and put in an extra parameter? Yeah, so what happens if you put in an improper URL? Um, so a lot of times you're just going to see either CodeIgniter yell at you, saying that either this controller doesn't exist or this parameter doesn't exist, or PHP could yell at you um, because you're trying to use a variable that actually isn't defined or you're passing it too many arguments. Um, so it could be one of those two things. It could be a CodeIgniter level issue, in which case you don't have any syntax errors or anything like that, but just CodeIgniter is looking for a class that doesn't exist. Or it could be a PHP level issue where you're trying to use a variable that's not defined. So CodeIgniter should be pretty good about displaying nice little error messages. Oh, is there a way to, like, if a user is in it, uh, they put in the wrong URL, is there a way to detect that, oh, it's going to my courses controller, can I have a default function? Yeah, so can we have kind of a, a default error function? So I think. Um, CodeIgniter has a special controller that will handle errors, or at least special views that can handle errors. And basically, if you ever detect an error, you can basically redirect the user uh, to one of those error pages and supply in some error message that you say. Uh, but that should be in the documentation, too. Yeah? So that's an interesting question. So what if we want to pass in an array to some controller function? So a couple options. You could do, like, if you, know, if you knew that you're only expecting you know, two or three values, you could separate them out and say slash one, slash two, slash three. But that's kind of annoying. Uh, one approach that a lot of APIs use, um, like Facebook will use this approach, and I'm not sure if uh, GitHub does, but they'll pass in instead of the actual array, they'll basically take that array and convert it to a comma separated list. So I would see here slash courses slash view slash one, comma two, comma three. And then my controller is just going to have this one parameter in my method. That's going to take that string, and I can call the explode function, which is my favorite PHP function, in case you're curious, to explode that comma-separated list into an array, where each item in that list is going to be a new item in the array. Does that make sense or no? Yeah. 
So in my opinion, the comma separated list, if you want to use the URLs like this, is probably the nicest approach. Um, but you can also pass things in, in the query string, which we'll see later, which is the equivalent of the um, question mark and then a equals b and c equals d. And there's a way that you can pass in arrays like that. Um, but I think that the comma separated list is probably the nicest approach if you want to be consistent with URLs that look like this. OK. So just a recap of things that do and do not happen under the MVC framework. So just a recap, requests are going to come from the browser. And the first thing that's going to care is the controller, because it needs to know uh, where this request is going to. So the controller is then going to call the model. The model is going to access the database, return the data, and the controller is going to send this data to the view. So that is kind of the overarching process here when I go to a URL. Things that do not happen, and if they do happen, your design grade will go straight down. Uh, the model does not call controller methods. right? If you have a controller and you want to call other controller methods, that's fine, because you could have something like a private method or some helper method that you wrote. That's fine. But you shouldn't be calling controller methods from the model or the view. Um, similarly, the view should never call model methods. And once you start integrating some client-side code, um, just realize that JavaScript doesn't call controller methods either. Right? I mean, this time we're dealing with a very different programming language. So let's say then that I want to effectively execute some controller method that's like slash courses slash view slash one. How do I make that code get executed under this MVC framework? Yeah. I have a question. Oh, sure. Exactly. So that's kind of the answer to my question, actually. So how do I make it so some controller method gets executed? I go there. Whether that be from a link, where I have the user click a link, like slash courses slash view, that means that that method's going to get executed. Or I go there via AJAX. So I can make a get or a post request to some URL, and that's what's going to be calling the controller data. So does that make sense? So if people are asking, you know, how do I, you know, how do I call my search functions from my view, or how do I call search from my model? That's kind of the answer. You want to bring your user to the URL corresponding to that action, whether that be um, explicitly through a link or kind of in the background via an AJAX request. Any questions on MVC overall? Exactly. So, we'll def so right now, uh, we're going to look at an example of how to do all of that. So I've built my model for my tweets at access to the database. I've built the view for my tweets, where I can display all the existing tweets, and I can add new tweets to my database. Um, so let's look at the controller uh, that kind of ties that all together. So here, I'm creating a new class called Tweets. I'm extending now a CI controller. We now know what that does. And so now here's something um, that's really nice. So f every time I use this controller, I'm going to want to use the tweet model. So in lab one, what we did was we said, OK, in every one of these public functions, the first thing I want to do is say this load model tweet and copy paste all the models that I needed into all of the methods. And as a good rule of thumb, if you're copy pasting anything in code, that's really bad design. So what we can do instead is kind of factor out all of this model loading. So we know that in every method in this controller, we're going to want the tweet model. So we may as well just move this into the constructor. So now, because the constructor is fired before anything else, we know that we've already loaded this tweet model. And by the way, um, the reason this is necessary is just a performance thing. Right? If CodeIgniter took the time to load every single model that you define, and you really only needed one of them, that would be pretty inefficient. Um, so that's why we're actually ex explicitly loading each of these models, so we get a pretty big performance gain. So uh, let's first look at the simpler function that's just going to display the tweets. So we know that we wrote this function in our model called getNewsFeed that's going to return to us some database data. So let's use that in our controller. We're going to store that in some variable called tweets. And now we're going to send this data along to the view. So remember where I put the view, I put it in tweets slash index.php. And the second argument to this is going to be the data that we're passing in. So because I have this associative array where one key is called tweets, that means that in my view, there is now a variable called tweets in the uh, global scope, essentially. What I call this variable does not matter. I could have said something like dollar sign objects equals this tweet get newsfeed, and then passed in object dollar sign objects inside of this associative array. Whatever I use as the key here is going to define 
what variable is now accessible in the view. Um, so it's this first part that matters, not the second part. It is nice to have them be the same, uh, just for stylistic purposes, though. Question? So that's an interesting question. So how, do, how does the view know what this array looks like? So you'll notice that in my view, I'm just kind of assuming, uh, well, it's got associated with the username, it's got associated with it some content, and I'm just going to access those properties. So that's a little bit inflexible. You're right. Like if I, I wanted to use this view for something else, you know, I couldn't do that anymore. Um, so that's just kind of the nature of PHP as a more dynamic language, where in Java you'd have to say, like, this class will only have these properties, and if you want to add another one, you have to explicitly define it. Where in PHP, if I want another property, eh, I'll just make it. Um, so if you want your view to be a little more adaptable, um, you can use some of those magic methods that we looked at uh, in class a little bit that can kind of tell the class what to do when I do something like tweet, uh, try to access this property called content. That's going to fire that magic method called get, that I can you know, respond, there is no content, or I can even return something else. But um, you could also use something like the isSet function, which we'll see in a moment, um, which will return true or false, um, depending on whether or not this property is defined. So you can pass in either an object or an array, and you can ask it, is this property set? And if it's set, you, know, you can use it. If not, you can look for something else. Um, so that might be one approach to using uh, this kind of more flexible view approach. But you're right. That's a, an important design observation to make when you're writing your code. You know, is this a lot of copy-paste? Could I kind of generalize this view to display both blog posts and comments? Um, and that might be one way you want to do that. So that's our reading from the database. So let's take a look at the writing. So the way that I'm going to write to this database is I'm going to send a post request to this method. And that means that it's not actually going to take any functions. Right? When I add a new tweet, I'm going to access a URL that looks like tweets slash add. And I'm not going to say slash username slash content. Well, I could. That's just not really that clean. It kind of breaks the semantics of HTTP uh, because a get request, it said, should never modify any state on the server. Only a post request should do that, along with some other obscure verbs. So I'm going to send a post request to this method. How can I do that? I can use either an Ajax post, or I can just create a form and say action is slash tweets add, like I've done here. So I have a form. I've said the method is going to be post. So that means that I'm going to be posting the data, not putting in the URL. And the action here is going to be slash tweets slash add. Um, so another thing, you'll notice that I've prefaced this action here with a slash. That's really helpful, because if I'm already at some other URL or I'm somewhere else on my server, I want to kind of reset myself to this beginning of the URL. right? If I didn't have this, and I was at a URL like slash tweets, it could do something like slash tweet, slash tweet, slash add, which isn't what I want. Um, so a lot of the time, you'll just want to start all of your URLs with this backslash, which says go to the very top of the document route um, rather than appending things to the URL. Question? Do you recommend that you really don't perform the code array methods, or just like So do I recommend using the code igniter for methods or writing out the HTML? Uh, so begin the opinion tag, of which I'll have many in this class. I personally think that PHP frameworks, frameworks are trying way too hard by writing these like form open methods. Because really, in CodeIgniter, I could say something like bracket, question mark, PHP form open post action. It's really the same thing as just writing the HTML yourself. It's kind of borderline lazy and unnecessary to be using it. So that's my opinion. I really think that PHP methods to generate HTML are pretty pointless when writing the HTML is pretty straightforward. Um, but if you like them, certainly feel free to use them. Um, as far as your grade is concerned in this class, um, your style is a lot based on your consistency. So we don't want to see form open, and then you write a form tag yourself. Um, just kind of pick one and be consistent. If you want my personal opinion that does not reflect anything, I think they're really stupid. Other questions? OK. So now let's take a look at how we're actually doing this database right. So back in our controller, we can now access this post data with this handy little code igniter thing. That's this. Now instead of DB, we're saying this input property is a property of the CI underscore controller class. We're saying, OK, I want all of the post data. So I don't want anything in the get, just everything in the post. So why is this helpful? 
Well, CodeIgniter allows you to introduce um, things like form validation rules, which are basically little functions that you can run over the entirety of the post data um, automatically. So when I say this input post, if I define these form validation things, which are defined in the documentation, uh, really easy to read, I can basically say, I want you to call something like HTML special chars or something like that over everything in my post array before I use it. So if you're looking to sanitize your database inputs, which we all know you should, and we'll all make sure that you do, um, that would be an ideal place to do it. So now, once I have my post data, you notice I'm just converting this associative array uh, to an object just because I can. In PHP, I can just say I want this to be an object and give it an associative array. I could also convert an object to an associative array by saying array instead of object here. And so now I'm again using my model. And I've written this function add, and that add function took a tweet, and I'm just making sure that it worked down here. So remember that I said in the event of some database insert error, I was going to return false. So now the reason we needed to do that error checking is because now as the controller, I should probably let my view know that it didn't work. So in this case here, uh, we're using JSON because we're eventually going to be using AJAX to create a tweet. So we're saying, all right, I just want to let you know in this very arbitrary format that I just decided that this success was false. So in my JSON response, I would see something like brace success colon false and brace. And that's something that the JavaScript can then use to parse and say something like, you know, you forgot to enter in a username or something like that. But it's really important that we don't just assume this worked, right? We introduce the error checking in the model. Now we should use that error checking that we introduced. So don't worry about that yet. But in the event that this succeeded, we're again just going to output some JSON here. So now instead of saying the success was false, it was now true. So my JavaScript can look at that to make sure it worked. And it also might be handy to return the ID of the tweet, which remember um, that add function is going to return the unique identifier representing the row representing that tweet. And so I might just want to send that to my uh, view um, inside of this JSON response. Make sense? OK. So uh, one more note. We are using uh, jQuery Mobile for this app. And jQuery Mobile is not PHP code. Um, this is going to be JavaScript, and it comes with some CSS and images. And these are what are commonly referred to as assets. So these are something that don't really belong in your application folder. Because remember, the application folder is not readable by the web browser. That's the whole reason we moved it out of HTML. So as a user, I can't accidentally you know, access one of your model classes and maybe do something cool with it. We want to make it so that by typing in a URL, the user is never actually going to be ac accessing one of those controller or model classes directly, like via the .php file. So what that means is that because none of those things are readable by the web browser, we can't put our JavaScript or CSS there. Why? Because our browser needs to get the JavaScript and CSS in order to use it. So these really belong underneath this HTML folder, uh, because only files under there can be set, read by the web browser. Yeah? Is that where a .htaccess file belongs? Yes, so uh, more on the .htaccess next. But yeah, it belongs in the HTML folder, because that also needs to be readable by the web browser. Um, so just a note on referencing these assets. So I mentioned before that if you start off your path without this backslash, it's going to be relative to where you are in the current file. So inside of your MVC framework, you know, you're in a model, you have your controllers and your views, and none of those are even in the HTML folder. So where are you really? I, I don't know. Somewhere that CodeIgniter arbitrarily defines you to be. So what you want to do instead is start off these paths with a slash. And that's going to say, OK, everything that comes next is going to be starting at this HTML directory. And this is really handy for all of your organization. So uh, let's just take a look at some little JavaScript file that I wrote. So if I go into my HTML directory here, you'll notice that I have separate directories for my CSS and JavaScript. And that's something that's a pretty good idea, because you don't want to be lumping everything together um, inside of one big, huge folder. So notice that before I did anything, I've already schmodded these directories. I always can get a little annoying, but hopefully that hook will uh, make this a little easier. So both of these directories need to be 711. So I should see um, a read, write x, and then two x's over there. So let's just go into our JavaScript folder. And again, uh, make sure that these directories are set, permissions are set correctly. 
So if I look in here inside of my lib folder, this is where I'm putting all of my library code. So I don't want to kind of lump together jQuery's code and jQuery Mobile's code and then all of my code. So I've instead introduced this little directory called lib, where I'm just putting all the code that I didn't write myself, which is, again, purely for organizational purposes. And here I have jQuery and jQuery Mobile. And I've been sure um, to schmod them 644, or else they're not going to work. And one way of simply verifying these permissions is if in your Chrome debugger tab, you look at the network tab, you'll see a bunch of 404 requests or 403 uh, responses if these permissions were not set correctly. So that's good to go. So now, again, purely for organizational purposes, you'll notice I've created this directory called tweets, and I've named my file index.js. Why? Well, this JavaScript file is going to be used by the tweets controller, and it's going to be used only in this index method. So there's just a nice symmetry here. So I'm loading the view called tweet slash index, and I'm loading the JavaScript file tweet slash index. So purely something that I decided to do, um, but nicely organized. So here you'll notice I'm using jQuery. So I'm starting off um, with the dollar sign function. So you may have also seen something that looks like this, document.ready. Yeah? I actually don't need to do that. Uh, a little shortcut for that is just the dollar sign function. So this, if you've never used jQuery before, is the code that I want to be executed once the DOM has loaded. So when I say the DOM has loaded, I mean that I've loaded all of the images, um, all of the tags have been parsed by the browser, and it's ready to be manipulated. I don't need to worry about any element not being defined yet, because this function waits for everything to be ready to go. So if you want any code to be executed uh, when your page loads, this is the place to put it. So if we go back to the view, we would see that I have some submit button, and I've given it an ID of btn-submit. So again, this BTN is, again, just one of my own stylistic conventions that represents that I am talking about a button element in case I forgot, or I want to call some other element uh, with an ID of submit. I don't have to worry about having those IDs collide. So this on function is a relatively new function uh, to jQuery, and it's just a nice combination of functions that you might have seen, like bind or live or even just the click function itself. This on just kind of combines them all into this one nice method. So I highly recommend you use that. It's very new. So when I click this submit button, which I know I've loaded because I've waited for the entire DOM to be loaded, what do I want to do? So first, I basically would like to construct an object that represents a single tweet. So where are those values coming from? <coughs> well, the user has typed them into the form. So I have this text content. That's the, first, the second input there, that big text area you saw. And then I also have some username access just using the val function to get back the actual text that the user typed in. So now I want to send this tweet to the server. And so here we're using Ajax. So remember that our controller is expecting a post request and not a get request. So I'm saying $.post, and here's the URL again. And this is the same URL that we saw inside of the form. We're starting with the slash so, we don't, so our browser doesn't get confused. This next argument here is the data that we're sending it. And so we're sending it um, something with properties, content, and username. And then this third, method, this third parameter here is the function that will be executed once this AJAX request succeeds or goes through. So you'll remember that in our controller, we essentially outputted JSON to the browser and then stopped. So here's where we're actually using that. So we're saying, I want you to parse this response that the controller sent back. So the controller sent back some JSON. So now we're parsing this JSON into a JavaScript object. So remember that success parameter, here's where we're using it. If this, this uh, AJAX request actually succeeded, that means that it was actually written to the database, and we want to then maybe display the tweet to the user, like update our newsfeed live. Now, if this didn't occur, we don't want to show the tweet to our user because it's actually not there. And if they refresh the page, they're not going to see their tweet anymore. So how are we doing that? A uh, little jQuery review. So we have on our page here some element called tweets. And it happens to be a UL tag for an unordered list. So to select that, again, we're just saying hashtag tweets because it has an ID of tweets. And we're calling the prepend function, which says inside of this element, I want you to put the following string at the very beginning. So there's also append, which will say, I want to put this at the end of the element. But remember, because we have newest tweets first, 
we want to put this at the top. So then we can just construct some string of HTML. So we're going to display to the user their username and the content. And that's all we care about right now. And then a uh, little jQuery thing, or jQuery mobile thing. So if we just add this to the list, our styles are not going to be applied. So by our styles, I mean that jQuery mobile styling that made our list views look so nice. So in order to actually apply those styles, we need to explicitly say um, list view refresh. Because I've said inside of my list view, I've read the jQuery mobile documentation, and I saw that I need to say uh, data list view or something like that, which means that I can now use this list view method and call refresh on it. So if you ever happen to be working with, oh, say, shopping lists of courses or something like that, and you want to dynamically update it with JavaScript, don't forget about this little list view method, which you can see just by reading the jQuery mobile documentation. So after that, I just want to clear out that input box, since if I'm submitting this via AJAX, that form isn't just going to be cleared automatically for me. And so just here's some good um, selector syntax. So if I say form without that hashtag, that's going to say I'm looking for every tag form. So every, yeah, every form tag, effectively. So now if I have the space here, that means that I'm now looking for a descendant of that form tag. So I happen to use the text area tag for typing in your tweet. So now I'm accessing all of the text areas that are stored inside of form tags. Now this comma means uh, basically, and I also want, again, everything underneath the form that is an input tag, but I don't want to clear out one of them. So if it is an input that is underneath the form and it does not have the ID of text username, then what I want to do, I'm just going to call val, which not only gets values, but it also sets them, send it the empty string, and that's going to empty it. Make sense? Can you that again? Yeah. So after I've submitted my tweet, I want to then clear out the form so that after, if I click tweet again, I, would, you know, I need to enter in a new tweet before I can click the tweet button again, right? So what we want to do is basically empty out those inputs. And the way to empty an input is just like getting the value of the input, which is this val function. And if you give an argument to this val function, you're saying what you want to set those inputs to. So if I just say quote, quote, that means I'm setting it to the empty string, which is basically just you know, an empty text box. So what do I want to actually clear? Well, I want to clear the text area where I entered in my tweet, which happens to be nested underneath a form. And in addition to that, I want to clear inside of that form all of the input tags. But I don't want to have the user have to type in their same username every time, just because we didn't bother with things like logging in. The user's just going to type in their username. Um, but I don't want to make the user retype in their username every time. So I've just said I don't want to clear out anything with an ID of text username. And so even though this is effectively going to return a collection or an array, I can still call this val function on it. Even though that this is definitely more than one element, well, what jQuery will do is effectively apply this function to everything returned in this collection. Other questions? Yeah. So if the, if the response failed, what would happen? So just looking at this code, I'm only clearing things out if I'm underneath this response success. So what should happen is a design decision that you'll make. You know, should the characters remain there? What error message should be displayed? That's up to you. Um, and the way you implement that is just by saying else and you know, something else in here. So you can do it explicitly or have Yeah, so if we don't explicitly clear them out, they're still going to be there. And so now, finally, these last couple lines, um, because this is a form tag, some browsers will take the liberty of submitting the form, even though I don't want them to. And so just to make sure that the browser doesn't actually submit my form, I'm just going to return false. And just to be super sure, because some browsers like to ignore this return false, I'm just going to use this prevent default method, uh, which you might Google around. You might have found, if you Google around, being like, the browser is submitting the form anyway, with lots of swears and exclamation marks. Um, so this will just say, browser, seriously, I'm not kidding, don't submit this form. So just another fun little JavaScript tidbit. So does this make sense, how this is working? OK, so just uh, to put this all in context, here's what our UI looks like. So again, I'm just using jQuery mobile. This is my data role equals header. Now this is my data role equals page. We have some inputs that are styled automatically. So if I can tweet Tommy, woohoo, and we'll look at tags in a minute. 
but now I click tweet, and I can see here's my tweet. These input tags have been cleared, and that's that. So, any questions on the basic functionality so far? Yeah? So where should the function call be in JavaScript? So um, in general, what I've done is I've created a separate JavaScript file. And that's going to house where all of my JavaScript functions live and what they all do. So when you call it? Yeah, so if we look back at the view, you'll see here that I've said I've loaded in this external JavaScript. So I could have also written you know, some JavaScript in here in a script tag. And I could have put that here just as well. Uh, but just for organizational purposes, it would be best to actually separate this out into its own JavaScript file. So this is inside of the view, remember. So as was mentioned a little bit earlier, we also have this little thing called .htaccess. And all this little file does is it makes your URLs prettier. So if we look at the contents of this file, HTML, .htaccess. So I've made sure that I've schmodded this 644. Um, and if you'd like to just copy and paste this and be OK with it, that's cool. Uh, we've posted this on the Lab 2 page. Um, but just what's going on here uh, is really these three lines that are important. So this says that if I make some request to something like slash courses slash view slash 1. So you'll notice that inside of there, I never said anything about index.php. So without this htaccess file, our server is going to say, OK, well, I'm going to look in the folder courses, look in the folder view, and look for a file called one, which obviously isn't going to exist. And you know, creating that file would be stupid. So what we want to do is say, OK, well, if I type in anything, so this at the beginning here is just a regular expression that says, I want to get exactly what was typed in. And I basically want to send that to index.php. So you may have noticed that without this file, you could have said something like slash index.php slash courses slash view slash one. But that's kind of ugly. So it, as a way of simply removing that index.php from the URL, I've just introduced this new rule that says, no matter what I type in, I want you to prepend index.php to that URL. So when is that a problem? So it's a problem when I'm trying to access JavaScript or CSS files. Right? Because I'm not, when I say I want to get jQuery.min.js, I'm not actually trying to call a controller method there. And I'm not trying to pass that as an argument to anything. I actually want that file. So when I type in that URL, I should actually get back the contents of that file. And that's exactly what's going to happen if I have a script tag or a link tag. It's going to actually look at that file. And if it can't find that file, um, then you're just not going to have that JavaScript or CSS loaded. So that's where these two lines come into play. And this says, well, if you're actually requesting either a file name or a directory, I don't want you to try to prepend index.php to the URL. So that's just what these two lines are saying. If you're, actually, if you're actually directly accessing a file, then just don't bother with that index.php thing. You don't have to worry about exactly, you, know, you won't ever have to reproduce this or like really understand how the server determines this. But that's basically what's going on here. And that's why having this HD access file allows you to remove index.php from your URL. And functionally, it doesn't do anything. This is just purely aesthetic. I don't want to have to type in index.php into all of my URLs. Um, but just make sure that you have actually schmodded this to be whoa, um, 644. Uh, because this file starts with a dot, when you say ls-l, it's not going to be shown. Because by default, we're hiding all of these files that start with a dot, which are typically system files. Um, so make sure that you've schmodded this 644, or you're going to get some really cryptic error messages about things not being found or not having permissions for things. Make sense? OK. So now that we have um, access, I, we've created our basic infrastructure for Twitter, our nice product manager comes along to us, and we say, OK, we're noticing all these users are posting these awesome tweets. It would be really great if they could also tag them with things. So whether that be a category, or if you've used Twitter, that little hashtag thing. So now we'd like to introduce this new feature while that we, now that we've built our kind of base application. So what do we need to do? So we definitely need a new tags table. And this is often a really good way of thinking about this. I have three letters in MVC. If I want to introduce this new feature, which of these letters, if any, is going to be effective, uh, effected? 
So first, the model. We're definitely going to need a tags table, because these need to be stored somewhere. And every tweet can have multiple tags. So in general, it's not good to try to store a list of things into a single MySQL row or into a single column. If you have a list of things associated with an object, it's best practice to just separate that out into its own table. So in this case, we're just going to have tags associated with tweets. So we're going to have a new table that are just for tags. So because we have this new table, that means we probably want a new model. What does this model need to do? It needs to be able to associate a new tag with an existing tweet, because you can't have a tag that applies to no tweet. And you also need to be able to get a bunch of tags at once. View, kind of a small change. We just want to be able to display them in the newsfeed. Uh, and our controller, um, we actually don't really need any new methods yet, but we can just modify those two existing methods to take into account sending in some tag data. So here are all the files that have been affected. So let's just quickly run through them. So first, the table. I've just made this simple tags table. You'll see here that it has a tweet ID, and it has the content of the tag. Again, we just have this ID. It's a primary key. It's auto-incremented. So I can uniquely identify each row. Because without this ID, I would have no idea uh, what row I'm actually working with. So now let's take a look at the model. So we look at the tag model. Whoa. So again, this looks pretty familiar. And in fact, I've essentially just copy and pasted my add function from my tweets model. So Tommy, top copying and pasting is bad. I agree. So you could probably factor this out into either its own model, that's just kind of a base model that extends CI model. And then it, instead of tag extending that CI model, you could extend your own model, where you could define some really handy functions that you find yourself writing over and over again. So this is a prime candidate for something like that where you could create some model whose only purpose in life is to add some new functions to the CI model. So you'll extend that instead of extending CodeIgniter's model. So that's pretty straightforward. And so now, let's think about the problem of loading the home page now. So what we want to do is, given some list of tweets, we want to get all of the tags associated with those tweets. So perhaps a naive approach here uh, would be, instead of getting all the tags for a list of tweets, to get all of the tags associated with a single tweet. What would be the problem with this? Aha, exactly. So the problem with this is it's really terrible performance. So in your web application, one of the slowest things that you can do is make a database query. So if you find yourself writing a database query in a loop, that's really bad for your performance. If you said something like, uh, for each tweet as tweet, load the tags, that's going to go to the database, and it's going to perform a select. And it's going to do that as for as many times as you have tweets. And that's going to be really bad performance and pretty bad design. So what we want to do instead is load all of the tags for some list of tweets. So that means that when I load the home page, I'm only now going to be loading I'm only going to be hitting the database once even though I'm loading tags for every tweet. And this will be much better performing. So to do that, I'm going to use this where inquiry that we looked at a little earlier. So I'm going to say where this tweet ID column has one of the values that I passed in. So in this case, as I've documented here, this tweet IDs is just an array of tweet IDs, not tweet objects, just the IDs associated with them. So now, uh, once I, get, I specify the where in, I'm going to get from now the tags table and look at the result. So I have now just all of the tags that are associated with tweets. But now this is a little disorganized, right? Because they're not in any predetermined order. And I can't, in constant time, just get all the tags associated with the tweet with an ID of something like 1, 2, 3. So we can improve this a little bit by kind of restructuring what we're returning. So rather than just returning this unordered list of tags, that while it happens to be that tags for tweets are next to each other, if I want to say, if I want to do something like get the tags for tweet 1, 2, 3, I actually have to iterate through this entire array and look for tags with 1, 2, 3. So if I'm doing that uh, for n tweets, and I have to iterate over the array n times for each of those n tweets, that's an O of n squared, which is pretty bad for performance. So what I want to do instead is make this lookup constant time. So in order to say I want all the tags for tweet 2, that should just be a simple constant time operation. So to do that, I'm creating this new array, which I've just called result, which is going to group all of the tags for the same tweet into the same element in an associative array. 
So the key of this associative array, as I've documented, is going to be the tweet ID. So this is an associative array where the key is just going to be the string of the tweet ID. So the value of each element in this array is going to be a list. And the list is going to be all of the tags that apply to this tweet ID. Yes, that's it. So now what we have here is basically an associative array where each key is a different tweet ID, and the value is the list of tags that are associated with that tweet. So does this make sense to everybody? It'll make a little more sense when we're actually looking at the, the controller. OK, so now let's open up our tweet controller, since we need to modify that too. Or the model, I should say. So. OK, so now we know that by just this is what we had before, and we know that that's just going to return the newest tweet objects, and there's going to be 20 of them. So that's straightforward. So now remember that uh, this getForTweets method is going to ask for a list of tweet IDs. So what we can do here is use the handy dandy array map function in PHP, which is basically a function that says, um, for each element in this list, I want you to apply this function to it. So what I'm doing here is just building an array of rather than the tweet objects, but just the actual ID of that object. So by saying I want to return the ID of each element, I now have an array called tweet IDs that, is just, that just looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, rather than the objects themselves. So now I can take this list and pass it into the method I wrote for tag. So now I'm going to get back all of the tags associated with these tweets. But now I have two variables. I have a, tweets, a list of tweets, and I have a kind of messy list of tags. So for clarity, I want to actually make this association. So when I look at my tweets array, I can say something like tweet arrow tags. And that's not going to happen automatically, um, but we need to do it ourselves. So we're going to, again, uh, use a PHP for each loop because we want to make an association with each of our tweets. Now you notice that I have this little ampersand here, <coughs> um, which is not pointers, don't worry. Um, but what this says is that I want to actually be able to modify this variable called tweet. So if I make any modifications to this object, which you can see we're about to do by adding a property, that it's going to stay there outside of the scope of this loop. Without this, then anything I modified would immediately fall out of scope. And when I actually returned it, those changes wouldn't be reflected. Um, so the ampersand will do that. And so now I'm creating this new property called tags. So each of my tweet objects now has a tags property. And what is it? Well, in order to determine what tags we need, I'm going to take a look at this separate tags array. And so some of our tweets might have tags, and some of them might not. So I'm going to say, remember, that this tags is indexed by tweet ID. So I can get all of the tags for each of these tweets just by saying tags and then tweet arrow ID, because that's the way, remember, that we've organized this list. So I can make this association. If it exists, then I want to say, all right, the value of this property is going to be this array because this tags is a two-dimensional array. And if this doesn't exist, well, then I want you to be an empty array so that when I try to use for reach on it later, I don't get yelled at for trying to iterate over something that I can't. So now this says that if this tweet has any tags, it's going to be inside of this property. And if it doesn't, this property is just going to be an empty array. Does that make sense? OK. So next, uh, we can just take a look at the controller. So again, we just had to modify our add function a little bit. Um, for each of the tags that have been sent to us, we want to add this to our database. And we already wrote that add method, which looked just like the other one. Uh, this was just sent to us in our AJAX request because we've added a new tags property. So we add those to the database. Now you notice here that I don't need to modify this at all. right? We've noticed that our model function now is making these associations. We just, we just modified this get newsfeed method and now get newsfeed is going to also return the tags associated with each of these tweets. So this is kind of the beauty of MVC. We haven't changed our controller at all. The controller doesn't even know that the model has changed. But because we've changed that model, we're actually adding in this new functionality without really having to touch much of our other controller code. So um, the view is also just a very minor change. So if we look at this tweets view, You'll notice here that instead, um, we're now, so now just displaying all of the tweets. And this implode function is kind of the opposite of explode. So I guess it's my second favorite PHP function. And it takes an array, and it goes through each of the elements that an array of that array and constructs a string. So it's going to take the first element, 
and then it's going to append to it whatever I specify here. So I'm appending a comma and then a space. I'm just going to take the second element and add it to that string. So basically what I have back here is a comma separated list of all of the elements inside of this PHP array, um, which is what produced something that looks like that. Make sense? OK. So does everyone kind of see how we're making these associations? So we're associating a tag with a tweet. So to do that, every row in our tags table needs to have the unique identifier for the tweet it corresponds to, or a tweet ID. So using that tweet ID, we're able to answer the question, get me all of the tags associated with this tweet, which is effectively the only question that we need to answer in order to display the news feed. So does that make sense? So you know, how, the, how we're going to change our models a little bit, uh, how we created a new model for this other table, and we've modified our existing model to actually make these associations. And a lot of other PHP frameworks, uh, which you're free to use for the other project, this kind of thing can happen automatically. Um, but in CodeIgniter, we want you to write it yourself. Questions on that? So one last thing. Let's say we wanted to implement something like search over all of our tweets, uh, which is kind of similar to what you're doing. So again, we are adding a new feature. We want to ask ourselves three questions. What do we need to do to the model? What do we need to do to the view? What do we need to do to the controller? So first, if we're adding a search feature, we definitely want to modify the controller because we have some new function that's going to correspond to some new URL. So we definitely want to add something new in our controller function. What about our model? We do, because right now we only have the ability to add new posts or get the, mo the 20 newest posts, which doesn't really lend itself to searching over the entire database. So we're definitely going to need to modify the model as well. So let's do that. So let's just define this new method called search, uh, where I can search the contents of the username um, or the content. So CodeIgniter, because I read the documentation, I've noticed that it has this function called like, um, that instead of matching, doing a simple equality match, it's going to see if what I've specified is a substring of any row. So I'm going to look for inside of the username, table, username column and the content column, the values that I've specified. So an or them together, because I have these separate functions called or for oring, not anding. And now I'm just going to get those results. Pretty simple. I'm just going to look at all of the rows that match either the username or the content if I specify it. So the reason I have this if username is con if content is because I don't want to accidentally trigger an error uh, where if this is not defined, then I'm going to get yelled at. So only if these two variables are defined and they're not false or the empty string do I want them to be considered inside of my query. So the controller method for this is pretty simple. So I'm going to say, all right, I want to get the username and the content from the URL. So what I could have done is defined it up here and said something like uh, username and content. And then this URL would have looked something like slash tweet slash search slash Tommy slash CS164. And that's a little bit confusing. I mean, this slash thing works pretty well for hierarchical data, but it's not clear from the URL that I just said what parameter is what. It's not clear that the username in the is before the content, and that's just going to be an arbitrary decision that I made and one that I'm going to forget. And if your users are ever trying to use an API you wrote, they're probably also going to forget the order in which the arguments are supposed to appear. And so while you could just say, read the documentation, what's a little bit better is to instead utilize uh, the query string. So just because we're in this CodeIgniter framework, that doesn't mean that we're no longer using PHP. Which is, it's kind of easy to get lost in that and only think of things in terms of controller method, uh, CodeIgniter methods. But we still have. Uh, back from our non-MVC days, this super global dollar sign underscore get. And know that uh, CodeIgniter also provides that get, me a get method uh, inside of that this input object, for which we also had a post method to do this. Um, but just as a reminder that this is still PHP, we can do something like this. We can say, well, I can allow the user to specify a username and content inside of the URL. So then using those parameters, I'm just going to send them to my model. That's going to give me back all of the tweets. And here, I'm just going to output them. So in the time we have before lab, if you want to kind of play around with this code, uh, which I'd recommend you do, um, one of the things you can do is try to write this view. Right? I didn't write it for you. I'm just going to output uh, what the tweets look like so you can see what, you know, see what data you got back. So maybe that could be something you might want to do. Uh, try to write this view. And you'll notice that I have intentionally omitted something, um, which you'll find. 
So let's take a look at how we'd invoke this. So I haven't added, updated my view at all, but if I say something like uh, tweet slash search, and then username is Tommy, that URL now looks like this. And this is a little bit easier to parse than search slash Tommy. Because alternatively, you know, if I wanted to search content now, instead of saying username, I can now say content. And now I'm not going to get anything back because nothing's going to match. Um, and if I didn't have this query string, I would have had to say something awkward like search slash slash where this is empty, and that just looks kind of silly. So this might be one instance in which you prefer to use um, this method of passing in data, or using get, or which is also called the query string, um, which kind of lends itself nicely to non-hierarchical data, like in this case, searching over an arbitrary number of columns. So any questions on that? Or questions on MVC in general, or how to get started on your projects, or get, any, get over any conceptual humps? Yeah. Yeah, so what we didn't cover um, was how to use local storage. So a really good resource if you want to learn about local storage is to Google MDN, uh, which is the Mozilla Developer Network. Uh, look at local storage. And although I use Chrome, I very much endorse the Mozilla Developer Network because it has some uh, great documentation. Not that one, but the first hit. There we go. Um, and so this just has some nice examples of using local storage. Um, but in short, local storage is just an associative array. It is just like any other JavaScript associative array. You can define arbitrary keys, and you can give those values, uh, give those keys arbitrary values. Only constraint here, um, that is not true for any other JavaScript array, is that all of these values must be strings. So um, in order to store a list of data or store an object, um, you might want to store that as JSON. Because this nice JSON object, we saw JSON.parse. There's also the opposite of that, which instead of taking a string and making it an object, if you call the stringify function, which is an awesome name, it will take an object or an array, and it will convert that to a string. And now that it's a string, you can then put it in local storage. Um, so that is, in short, how to use local storage. And this local storage object is just in the global namespace. So just like we have document, we have window, you can just access this global variable that the browser has defined for you. Another question? Yeah, so can we also utilize some other mechanism, mechanisms to convert this to strings? Absolutely. Um, the JSON parse and stringify uh, just might be the, uh, an easy way of doing that. If you already have an array and you just want that to be an object, to be a string, you can do that. Uh, but you can also uh, do that in JavaScript. So if we actually look at, why did I do that? Index. So the corollary to implode in JavaScript is this join method. So remember, now that I've sent this, I uh, have this tweet data, and I have, sorry, now that I've constructed this tweet, and I've created this property called tags, where this is just a list, and so when I sent that list to the server, I could iterate over it, I can now say uh, tweet.tags.join, and this will do the same thing. It'll take this array, of this tags array, and just construct a string that's comma separated. The JSON approach might be a little cleaner, um, but do whatever you think is the best design. Other general questions on this section or on anything? OK, well, I'm going to hang out here um, until lab starts. So feel free to ask me any questions you have about your project. Else, good luck finishing it up. <laughs>